thanks everybody for being here, hanging out, waiting for me. Because I'm the second best guy here and the best guy's right there. And I love following him. Okay, my goal today is to give you one thing that you can consider, which I recommend to specifically add to your casting, but you ought to consider what those two hands do. Because there's, there's some things that just aren't my opinion. It's not my opinion how this rod moves. It's just a state of nature. One of the things, especially in recent years, this was 1970, things would be a little different. But those rods pretty much just ain't around anymore. Now we get these rods what we just call progressive. And they kind of bend this way. Weak part of the rod, not so weak, powerful. And why they have it like this isn't so you can push with your top hand and use this thing as a pry bar, because you got the weak end of the pry bar out here. And this orange thing is the load, resistance. So why they shape it this way is not how you come in to bend, come in to load, it's how this rod straightens and propels the line. So when we say, ah, the rod's got a fast tip or it's fast action, what it means is the overall rod bends much more in the tip and has more support in the butt. It's not a perfect world, but if I had a shorter head, a shorter line, a line that moved quite well, this action would be a perfect match. And knowing rod action and your fly line is, well, probably the third thing is how you cast, but you combine those three. If you can line those up, bang, you got the perfect outfit because it matches you. The rod action matches the line length. So if I slow this rod down and I put a load on it and I see this, now it tells me, ah, oh, this is what they call a slow tip. Doesn't mean it doesn't gain any horsepower. What it means is that when the rod unrolls, it does it at a longer, slower pace. So if I had a big, heavy payload, a resisting fly, a long line. A slower tip is the perfect match. So now I might have two different rod actions in my quiver because I got two different lines for different, two different spots. If I had a Skagit rod, man, it'd look like this. I want something firm so I can, I can chuck something meaty. But if I had a long belly line and I was searching a lot of water, making a lot of casts, well, well, I can tell you, around 1988, I did this fly line for 3M, and I wrote it out on a piece of paper, sent it to the guy. I was fishing 40-foot shooting heads, and I caught all the fish I wanted. This is a 70-foot head. 70, well, way forward. Became extremely popular in Europe. And finally I decided, well, I just need to cast it. I'm working down in the Lower Snake in the 90s, and I spent two days throwing that damn long line. What I did learn is I didn't catch more fish, but I fished two additional pools that day. And it really struck home. If you're searching a lot of water, you might consider going to a long belly because it picks up that few, you think it's just a few seconds. Well, it takes a lot longer. Strip all that line in when you can just swing back, power it off, send her back out to work. You're catching fish with a fly in the water, not making a cast. Casting is like fighting fish. It's downtime to the next fish. So, 
rod action. Now, let's get back to the start of the story. What these two hands do is dictated by rod action. You got a progressive rod, you need to really consider controlling that top hand. In teaching little kids, I've had some little tykes, you know, and I've made a point of never telling them turn to crack the wrist, and they would do it on their own. So it's an instinctive thing to take your top hand and think you can plow into it and she's gonna go more. Well, it doesn't work out that way. Rotation shifts the rod from bending in the butt and it will straighten the butt and move it right up to the tip. So, where are we? Ah, get out there, it's time to go to work. Yeah. Okay. So, if I pull even, I should get an even bend. If I start rotating, I'll get a candy cane affair. Wouldn't matter if I do it overhead, wouldn't matter if I do it on the water. If I rotate a lot, I get a candy cane affair. So, even bend. Up by the white tip, even bend, high rotation, candy cane. The problem with the candy cane is, if you had to cast 30 feet, good idea. Nice way to cast 30 feet. But if you need to cast further, working off the tip just ain't working. So rotation is a bad thing Rotation is something that you've got to understand, you've got to control, you've got to use it to your benefit. Why I bring that up is, in years of teaching, yeah, one of the repetitive things, a guy is using too much top hand. It's just over and over and over. A lot of times it's because, well, he signs his name with his right hand, so he decides, well, that's where I put the rod, is in my right hand. And he's been casting single hand, oh no. So he cast it basically single hand. Well, I hate to tell the guy, he did write a check for $1,000 and bought his outfit, but he'd probably be better off just use a single hand. What that single, the top hand does, it decides loop shape, trajectory, the flight plan. So where I'm gonna go? This hand decides how I'm gonna go. This is what drives the rod. This is what aims the rod. And it wouldn't matter if you're making the forward cast or you're just trying to position the line. If you position the line with your upper hand, candy cane, you're using the weak part of the rod to muscle the resistance of the line. And a lot of times that creates a whole host of problems. So if you could just decide to use both hands to make your lift and sweep, problems go away. But that same thing on the forward cast is controlling those two top those two hands and make them work the same way. So if I had my two colored gloves, I'd put my green glove on this hand and I'd put a red glove on this hand because the green hand tells me where I'm gonna go. And the red hand tells me how. It's got the power, it's got the drive, it's got the stop. So I'm gonna take the pull and drive. So, if I rotate excessively, I can create wide loops, I can create tailing loops, and bulbous loops. One of the problems is, there's so much stuff going on, it's really hard to tell what 
that should feel like. So in a cast, you should feel the rod at the base of the hand with your upper hand. It's right there on the base. And actually, that's the strongest part of the hand is right there. It pushes right up against that bone. So the base of the hand, if you feel the rod roll up onto your thumb, you're pushing the rod with the upper hand. Like it or not, it's just the nature of the game. And you're just driving the rod with the rod tip. So just cut 20 feet off your cast and smile. If the same in the bottom hand, you know, there's like half a dozen different grips, but you can make a hand, you can make a cast by just clutching your hand. So you should hold the rod properly with the ball in your hand here. So I will feel the rod butt shaft pull in the same spot of my hand, right in this ball right here. Hey, get out of the rocks. Let's go to work. Come on, come on, come on. Up and around, Allen and out. The old 1960s Jim Green phrase when he was teaching single hand is the same math as we could use today. It's almost identical. It's like, holy mackerel. And that's because a cast is a cast. And it wouldn't matter if it's single hand or two hand. And that old phrase is, under and up, over and down. Under and up, over and down. It's just a nice, smooth, under and up, over and down. The under and up creates that circle up. That brings the elbows up. And the over loads the rod and the down drives the elbows down. And by pulling the elbows down, you keep the rod in a pulling motion, which prevents that top hand from driving the rod. Should get a nice butt cast every time. But coming back to that rod action, our main goal is not to flip the tip over. Our main goal is to acknowledge nature, acknowledge the rod action, and just simply straighten the rod. Joan Wolf, she calls it power snap. And she does single hand, same thing. It's done with the base of the hand, the heel of the hand, and the smaller fingers. Pulls in, makes a great cast every time. Because she's not pressing with the thumb. But just like the upper hand and the two hand, that thumb in her cast is a fulcrum. It's supporting the rod. So that's my goal in two hand, to do the same math she's using. This is the fulcrum. This is the support. And where that support goes, that's the trajectory, flight plan, and loop size. So where? So the driver is back here. So by pulling, I pull the rod straight. and I control rod rotation. Prevent yourself from thinking that I'll get one inch further if I just push a little harder with that upper arm because it's gonna take about 10 foot right off your cast real quick because you're gonna lose that butt strength and she's gonna bend in the tip. So. Under and up, over and down. Under and up, over and down. And it wouldn't matter what cast we're gonna use. Under and up, over and down. Control rotation. That's why when we change positions of the line, we don't try to swing with our upper arm to make it. We turn with the hips. 
I'll make a big turn, pass over there. It's done with the hips. Same idea. I'm trying to minimize rod rotation and maximize rear butt bend. So, coming back, what does it feel like? Sense the feel in the base of the hand. Sense for that thumb. It should be just the feel of the cork. You should be able to put race paper here and slide race paper out. So nice, aim, go. Keep that rod on the heel of your hand. If you press forward, which is very easy to do, very instinctive to, to get that extra negative 10 feet. Remember that driver is down here. And it took me a lot of years to kind of gravitate to this. It's like 40 years I've been doing this. But one of the things that I've learned in my younger years is fishing a lot of junk water, is that I could derive a cast by just pulling hard and tightening the body core. And that's where I found just the suitcase grip beats very suitful. Because I can put the death grip on this cork and I can snap that rod straight, straighten the rod and make the cast. One of the things I usually joke with myself is I'll be in a crap spot. Well, no one else can fish there. And you know, I like catching fish, but I'm not very good at it. So I want to go to places that are really junky that no one else has fished. And that fish has been rested. And they're pretty easy to catch. Even I can catch them. So being able to cast with zero back cast is, to me, about the only reason why you would use this thing is zero back cast. And I use you chuckle when I get caught in the brush. Because there's a limb, you know, poking me in the cheek. So mastering that, you really have to be able to develop this tummy crunch thing. And forcing yourself to develop that stop from your core. And this is where Jim Green would talk about positive stop. And what Jim liked is that when you came in and you were trying to straighten that rod, make a stop, that your body core, your whole person became absolute still. And the bent rod then projected from you, which is pretty critical on a tight sock because I'll take two thirds of your casting stroke away. And by the way, we're not moving the target. The target's the same place. But that is the game of play in that tight game. And developing that core strength really moves away from swinging that top arm, which is going to rotate that rod too soon and shorten your cast by 20 feet. So as much as you can, as you can pull the elbows down, what did Jim say? over and down. Just pull those el elbows down. And the only way to really do that proper is just not to do this, but to pull from your stomach. Pull the core down and do that crunch, man. How many of you are taking Pilates classes? Nobody, no, well, well, well best thing you could do is take, get some tummy crunches in there and pull the elbows down to come forward. Under and up, over and down. Just a tummy crunch. But working on that crunch really helps to master this. The elbow's gonna come down to come forward. It's not gonna punch and push on that cork. And it wouldn't really matter if I changed the casting stroke. If I was a short stroke, I would be more vertical. Short line, short stroke. And if I start lengthening the line, that line length is gonna determine a longer stroke and it wouldn't matter. I'm still gonna use down 
under and out, I'm just going to stretch it. So it's not the fact that the casting stroke is longer and linear, because the line is longer, I am still operating on the under and up, over and down. I'm still running on this elliptic path of pulling the rod straight, controlling the top hand. Because its job, well, flight plan, loop size, but it's holding against all the work being done over here. So I'm going to hold against this work right here and I'm going to pull on it. So this, yeah, it does have to hold against that. It's not weak. And it's not being held in a ringlet, which is dissipating entry. And it's not being pulled by an inglet or ringlet, which is also dissipating energy. Under and up, over and down. So how far I travel is just basically how much stroke length I have behind me and how long that line is. So controlling top hand. I really encourage everyone to give some consideration to it. And one of the one of the best things for practice, I, I couldn't care less if you want to go cast all your buddies and be the best bay caster in the world, but one of the best things you can do is go to the other town and go to the ball field and do a lot of overhead casting. And just do a lot of it. Because what overhead does is take away the water resistance and all the other fundamentals that it will play in creating loops and driving the forward cast. Basically what it does have is a backstroke that has to have a nice aerial loop, but it has that same forward cast that has to have a nice aerial loop. And it forces you to develop a stronger bottom hand authority because if you start driving an overhead cast with the top hand, you're going to end up with spaghetti in the sky. It just ain't going to work out well for you. So, go to the next town, wear glasses, change your hat, work on overheads. And, what the heck, you know about if it wasn't overcast. It was a nice, beamy, sunny day in Lewiston. About 2 o'clock, 2.30, 2 o'clock, we get the blow. And all oh, the speed casters, they all leave the water because they're all getting blown off. Well, you get out your little baseball bat rod and since you've been working your overhead, get your 30-foot head out. All those runs opened up because everybody left because the wind's blowing. You're back in the game. Did it for years. Got it. Caught a lot of fish on them really windy days. So, what is my gig? Hey, two o'clock. So, I'm at the end of my time. I encourage you to give consideration to what those two hands do and your rod action. Build yourself to make the perfect outfit that you just love. And I don't care what the brand is as much as it fits you and makes your cast fishing just fantastic. And the pathway is controlling the top hand, where I want to go, how I want to go. Thanks everybody! Yahoo!